the Sustainable Development Goals, Old Wine and New Bottles. Since their adoption at the United Nations Summit in New York in 2015, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, have become the central reference point in international development cooperation. Also, for our research center, the Global Partnership Network. What is the purpose of the Sustainable Development Goals? There are many, but the first and foremost is ending poverty. According to the Agenda 2030 of the United Nations, we as the United Nations are determined to end poverty. And the United Nations Development Programme underlines, the SDGs are a bold commitment to finish what we started and end poverty in all forms and dimensions by 2030. Finish what we started, they are referring to the Millennium Development Goals, the SDGs' predecessors, who according to UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon have been the most successful anti-poverty campaign in history. If we look at the Millennium Development Goals report of 2015, it says that extreme poverty has declined significantly over the last two decades. In 1990, nearly half of the population in the developing world lived on less than $1.25 a day. And this proportion dropped to 14% in 2015. Globally, the number of people living in extreme poverty has declined by more than a half, falling from 1.9 billion in 1990 to 836 million in 2015. As critical social scientists, our task is not to take everything the politicians say at face value, but to question and analyze it. So let's put a question mark behind the statement that the SDGs are ending poverty and take a closer look. We find that some social scientists are advancing hypotheses which claim that the SDGs are less beneficial for the poor than they seem. Let us look at some of them. Number one, the SDG wine is old. Jan Orby and Sarah Dilputter from the Ghent Center of Development Studies are asking who wants some more old wine in new bottles, referring to the SDGs. What they mean by this becomes clearer if we look at the historical context and the history of development goals and in particular the Millennium Development Goals. This history goes back a long way in time. Already in 1960, the first United Nations Development Declade Declaration announced that to end poverty was its goal. And it already set specific targets for growth rates and for official development assistance. The zero point percent target in official development assistance has been with us until today, although it has been reached only by a handful of OECD countries. The next declarations in 1970 and 1980 reiterated the promise to end poverty and in the 1990s we saw a whole decade of UN summits, the most prominent among them being the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, which adopted the idea of sustainable development. So the idea to reconcile economic growth on the one hand and the protection of the environment on the other hand. In 1996, the early ideas came up of international development goals in the OECD on the one hand, and on the other hand, on the World Food Summit in Rome in 96, which already announced that we need to halve world poverty during the next decade. Now, in 2000, then the UN, UN Millennium Report took over these aims, and in the De Millennium Declaration pronounced not only the goals of peace, development, and human rights, but also the promise to end poverty, leading to the Millennium Development Goals in 2001, and then later to the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, 
which adopted the ideas of the United Nations Conference in 1992. To discover the origin of these United Nations Development Decade declarations, we have to go back even further in history. In 1949, US President Truman, in his inaugural address, proclaimed a program of development for the underdeveloped regions. This program, he said, was designed to tackle world poverty. On the other hand, it was also designed to tackle world poverty not only because it was a moral obligation, but because it was a threat and a handicap. A handicap for the expansion of the US economy and a threat in regard to the expansion of world communism. So the idea was that world poverty could lead people to adopt communism and therefore it had to be fought. The program of development was then seen as a promise given in the context of the Cold War to the countries of the Global South, especially to the decolonizing countries, a promise which would allow them to become wealthy and affluent within global capitalism, so that there was no need to adopt a communist revolution. This also meant that within world capitalism, the colonial division of labor was more or less maintained. This promise of affluence within the global capitalist economy was then given for the next decades. Modernization theory was convinced at that time that after several decades, the underdeveloped regions could become developed. Now this faith was shaken by the end of the 1960s with the UN Person Report, which indicated that despite impressive growth rates, poverty reduction was stagnating in the Global South. And this then leads to what has been called the cycle of the development promise. The cycle of the development promise starts with the diagnosis of the diagnosis of a deficit. These countries are poor, they are underdeveloped, they are lacking several things. This diagnosis then led to a prescription. Prescription in the form of, well, they need capital, they need knowledge, they need technology, so these are the things we are going to supply. This was the promise of Truman's Point Four program. And within this program, the promise was given, then these countries will, if they follow the prescri prescription, these countries will become developed. By the late 1960s, it became clear it has not worked the way that people had envisioned. So the developed countries were still way ahead and the gap between the developed and the underdeveloped countries was widening. So instead of admitting the failure, however, the development organizations, above all the World Bank, came up with a new diagnosis, a new diagnosis of a deficit which basically was not reversing the old diagnosis but enhancing it saying, yes, it didn't work the way we envisioned, but we know why we have not taken into account rural poverty. So we have been focusing on infrastructure projects and economic growth, and we have to take into account the rural areas and the basic needs of the poor. So in 1973, World Bank President McNamara, who had previously been Secretary of Defense in the Vietnam War, proclaimed a war on poverty. And during the 1970s, the integrated rural development projects were then the new prescription, which would reiterate the promise of development. But also here, they were not as successful as envisioned. A new failure led to a new diagnosis. And this new diagnosis then again said, we have to take into account an aspect of these societies hitherto unmentioned, and that was women. So we have to take into account the role of women in international development. 
new prescription, new promise, new failure. Then they came up with the idea of markets. We have to take into account the role of markets. We have to take into account, this was the next step, the role of governance after realizing that the markets did not do the job. Then all these new inventions in the development organizations highlighted new aspects leading to new prescriptions, a new reiteration of the promise and a new failure. So this is the cycle of the development promise and now the question is, is the sustainable development agenda a departure from the cycle or not? Some people are arguing that a significant change in the SDG agenda can be discerned, namely that it is a universal agenda which includes not only the less developed but also the so-called developed countries. The transformations envisioned are, and this is a quote from the UN SDG documents, applicable to both developed and developing countries alike. So in this discursive shift we see that the object of discourse and the object of intervention has changed. The exclusive focus on geographical units in the south, defined as less developed countries, is abandoned here. However, the dualism remains. There are developing countries, which are the primary objects of the SDG policies, and there are developed countries which are primarily obliged to give aid and maybe even change their production and consumption patterns, foster new technologies and instill reforms in their economy. However, the dualism is still there and so far there have been no SDG interventions in the Global North. A second, maybe less important, but also discernible discursive shift is the return to what has been called 1970s rhetoric. And this concerns the point that the SDGs are no longer talking about a reduction of poverty, but its elimination. And they are also openly talking about inequality and justice. So these concepts re-entered the terrain of legitimate political issues after being absent in the MDG debate on the Millennium Development Goals. So this has been interpreted as a sign that the hegemony of neoliberalism clearly lost ground and we can also talk about global inequality again. However, we could also see that in the sustainable development goals there is still a reference to an open non-discriminatory trading system under the World Trade Organization. Now this open and non-discriminatory trading system is however a problem because while discrimination is usually seen as something negative in the context of world trade discrimination refers to highly unequal actors on the one hand local enterprises on the other hand huge multinational corporations so if we do not discriminate between these actors then we have a level playing field and a fair race which takes place effectively between a horse cart and a sports car. Now, next to these discursive shifts, we also encounter a lot of discursive continuities in the Sustainable Development Goals, elements which we know from earlier declarations. This has been pointed out by neoclassical economist William Easterly, as well as post-development theorist Arturo Escobar. Easterly is saying that similar statements by development corporation can be found from different decades, from the Stone Age, the Iron Age and the Silicon Age of development corporation. While Escobar with a similar statement says that the architecture of the discursive formation of development has remained unchanged since the mid 20th century. Now to examine these claims, I would like to go back 
to Truman's point four address and to compare it to important documents from the SDG agenda, namely the high-level panel report of eminent persons on the post-2015 development agenda. And if we compare these documents, we find several interesting continuities. Number one, the diagnosis, global poverty is a problem. In 1949, Truman said, more than half of the people of the world are living in conditions approaching misery, their food is inadequate, they are victims of disease, and their poverty is a handicap and a threat. 65 years later, we have similar elements. We are deeply aware of the hunger and deprivation of the people living in extreme poverty. There are references to undernourishment and to diseases. So here the diagnosis is quite similar, but also the promise that we can solve the problem today. This is the second continuity. In 1949, Truman said, for the first time in history, humanity possesses the knowledge and the skill to relieve the suffering of the people with this bold new program of development. In 2014, similar statements can be found. We have a historic opportunity to do what no other generation has ever done before, to eradicate extreme poverty. The world possesses the tools and resources it needs to achieve this bold and ambitious vision. Third continuity, the means by which this promise shall be realized. The first, technical solutions. 1949, there's a reference to imponderable resources in technic of technical knowledge, which are growing and inexhaustible. Greater production and modern scientific and technical knowledge are also referenced. And 65 years later, we again have the reference to the inexhaustible and growing resources, know-how and technology of the North. Scientific and technological breakthroughs and, again, greater production and growth. And here we come to the next continuity, the next recipe. Economic growth is still seen as preeminent to eradicate global poverty. Truman was talking about the stagnant economic life of these countries and about the need to foster capital investment in order to produce more, more food, more clothing, more materials, etc. In 2014, in the context of the SDGs, we read similar statement, calls for a profound economic transformation, which is, however, based on economic growth, qualified as equitable growth, but nevertheless, economic growth is seen as a prime factor in ending global poverty. The last discursive continuity is the credo of the harmony of interests. Already Truman said that all countries will greatly benefit from this program of development and that greater production would be the key to prosperity and peace. And precisely these statements can also be found in the 21st century where the documents say that countries have resources, expertise or technology that if shared can result in mutual benefit. However, without this sharing of resources and without development, there can be no enduring peace. Considering the first hypothesis, we have to say that the Sustainable Development Goals are a renewal of the promise of development. A promise of development which is based on a naive conception of politics, which assumes that the world leaders will pursue the benefit of the poor and which ignores relations of power and the function of the promise. The function of the promise being creating acceptance for the current capitalist world order through demonstrating or simulating a battle against global poverty. Second hypothesis, the SDG wine is watered down. Here I am referring to the criticisms by Jason Hickel and Thomas Poggy. And they claim that the United Nations have been cheating in their battle against global poverty by shifting the goalpost. That is, by removing the baseline of the global poverty count from 2000 
to 1990. This enabled the UN to include the successes of poverty reduction since 1990, where no one was talking about Millennium Development Goals. And what is more, Jason Hickel claims that the World Bank has tinkered with the international poverty line in such a way to let the struggle against global poverty appear far more successful than it actually was. And he points to a World Bank report from 2000 where the World Bank admits that the number of poor has been rising from 1.2 billion in 1987 to 1.5 billion. However, this was bad news for the public relations of the World Bank and a few months later, in 2001, the World Bank issued a new report based on a new method of counting the poor. And here, a changing international poverty line turned rising numbers of the poor into shrinking numbers. How did they do that? Because the international poverty line was no longer defined as $1.02 in 1985 purchasing power parities to $1.08 in 1993 purchasing power parities, which, taking into consideration inflation, is a lowering of the international poverty line. So fewer people are counted as poor. The same trick was played then again in 2008 where the international poverty line as $1.25 was introduced. And this allowed the World Bank to turn a rise in international poverty numbers to a reduction of 316 million people and even 437 million people after the second shift in the international poverty line. What Jason Nickel also points out is that almost all the successes in poverty reduction can be attributed to China. If China is taken out of the calculation, poverty increased massively in the 1980s and 1990s, even with the new international poverty line. And this is significant because China and East Asia were places where poverty has been decreasing and where no forced liberalization through structural adjustment has been taking place at least until the Asian crisis of 97-98. Hickel also claims that the international poverty line, even apart from these manipulations, is in fact inaccurate and too low. He gives the example of Sri Lanka, where 40% of the population were living under the national poverty line, so were being considered poor by their own government, whereas under the international poverty line, only 4%, only a tenth, could be considered poor. The second example he gives is from India, where 300 million people were living under the international poverty line in 2011, and the numbers were decreasing. However, 75% of India's population, which is about 900 million people, were subsisting on less than 2,100 calories a day. So one could argue we're suffering from calorie deprivation. 75% and this number has been going up from 58% in 1984. So obviously severely increasing undernourishment was taking place at the same time where the World Bank was claiming successes in poverty reduction. Therefore, Jason Hickel argues we need to adopt a more realistic poverty line, which would not be calculated on the basis of $1.25 a day, but on the basis of $2.50 a day, or if we orient ourselves more towards the so-called developed countries, which was based on $5 a day. And here, in the graphics, you actually can see that adopting these other poverty lines suggested by Hickel would lead to an entirely different picture considering the growth of 
world poverty. So considering the second hypothesis, we can conclude that the successes in poverty reduction claimed by the United Nations are mainly based on the successes of China and on statistical manipulation by the World Bank. Their misleading statistics are obscuring the extent of poverty and its increase outside of China. Third hypothesis, the SDG wine distracts from the empty stomach. This criticism has been launched by Ashwani Saith, who says these development goals or are a diversion from the significant questions of political economy. And if we now pursue this criticism, and if we look at the global economy, we find that the SDGs have some blind spots, apparently. They are mainly focusing on international development cooperation. However, serious attempts to reduce global poverty should not be limited on official development assistance, which numbers around 150 billion US dollars per year, but sh they should include other areas which are more significant for global poverty. One of them is labor migration and related to this the question of freedom of movement. The World Bank has discovered in the past two decades that the remittances sent home by migrants in the Global North to their families in the Global South amount to around $350 billion per year, a sum which is much, much larger than the entire official development assistance. So this is something which could be taken into account if one is serious about reducing global poverty. However, as the political situation and the political climate in the North makes it difficult to discuss these issues, this is conveniently left out by the SDGs. Another serious issue is the financial transfer which takes place every year from the South to the North. In the graphic which is depicted here, we can see that this transfer is twice as large from the South to the North than in the opposite direction. Why is that so? Four main factors should be mentioned here. One is tax evasion by multinational corporations, but also by other actors, which amounts to 385 billion US dollars. A second factor is the repatriation of profits, almost 500 billion dollars per year, which is repatriated from multinational corporations from the south to the north. The third factor is the debt service. One rarely talks about the debt crisis nowadays, but still almost 600 billion dollars are transferred to the banks in the north in the context of servicing debts. And the fourth point is illicit financial flows from the south to the north mainly in the form of elites parking the money they have gained through corruption or grey area economic transfers in northern banks. One point we have not been mentioning so far is world trade. Global trade is actually a crucial factor in questions of global poverty and here the effects of neoliberalism of market-oriented reforms have been detrimental to the global poor. This is also not mentioned in the Sustainable Development Goals. And the last point, which should also be mentioned, does not deserve any mention either in the SDGs, apparently, and this is the question of reparations for colonialism. After exploiting their colonies, sometimes for huge periods of time, no colonial power has ever gotten the idea of paying reparations to compensate for the damage which has been done. These blind spots of the SDGs lead us to the third hypothesis that serious poverty reduction must deal with global economic structures. And here we could actually 
learn from the experiences which have been made with the attempts to establish a new international economic order in the 1970s. And we could also learn from the experiences with global structural policy. So a policy to transform global economic structures for the benefit of the poorer parts of the world population. Fourth hypothesis, actually we should be drinking water instead of wine. This is a hypothesis which is promoted by scholars from the post-development school like Wolfgang Sachs or Ashish Kotari. And they are questioning whether the so-called developed societies can really be a model for the rest of the world. Already Gandhi was doubting whether a good life can be reduced to a high income. And the post-development school has maintained that we need to differentiate between different types of poverty, between frugality and destitution. While frugality is a lack of income, while the basic needs are still satisfied through subsistence agriculture and access to water, destitution is an entirely different thing. Here, the basic needs are not satisfied after the access to water, land and other resources has been made dependent on money. In such a situation, a low income severely hinders the fulfillment of social and economic human rights. Also, we have to ask whether the gross national product and the per capita income are adequate indicators of wealth and a good society. After all, as has been pointed out many times, many things are counted into the gross national product which do not seem necessarily as beneficial to people, such as oil spills or wars. Critics like Gandhi, Esteva or Robert Kennedy have been pointing out that we should question whether we should measure a good society according to these indicators. Although the indicators of the United Nations Human Development Index are certainly broader than the GNP, nevertheless the question remains, what about morality, hospitality or sufficiency or dignity? Or on the other hand, what about crime, racism and suicides? Should these factors not also be taken into account if we are talking about a good society? For ecological reasons, we also have to admit that the industrial model of society cannot be universalized. The non-sustainable use of resources and the oligarchic or imperial way of production and consumption are certainly something which cannot be replicated all across the world. This imperial way of production and consumption means that it is based on the appropriation of cheap resources and cheap labor in other countries. So clearly we need new measurements of wealth and a good society. One of the attempts to do so is the Happy Planet Index. A Happy Planet Index which measures sustainable well-being. The factors that are taken into account here include subjective well-being, so are you happy with your life? The life expectancy as measured in the Human Development Index as well, but also questions of inequality and questions of the ecological footprint. And if you look at this map of the Happy Planet Index, you will realize that those countries with the highest indicators and the color green on this map are not to be found in Europe or North America, where undoubtedly people are enjoying a high standard of living, but on the other hand are producing an ecological footprint which is simply not sustainable. So the countries which are green on this map are to be found in Middle America or Southeast Asia, where basically an adequate level, an adequate standard of living is being combined with a relatively low use of 
natural resources. Concluding, considering the fourth hypothesis, we can say that improving people's lives must also deal with the imperial way of production and consumption. The diffusion of a model based on the appropriation of cheap resources and labor elsewhere is certainly not sustainable. Non-renewable resources and destruction of the climate are factors which have to be taken into account if we are talking about a model of a good society. Alternative models need to be based on sustainability and solidarity, above all in the North as well. Here we can subscribe to the intention of the Sustainable Development Agenda that the North has to change as well. Coming to the end of this lecture, we have to say that yes, indeed, the SDG wine is old, as has been seen in the discursive continuities between the Point 4 Agenda of 1949 and the 2015 documents examined here. We also have to say that the SDG wine is watered down by statistical manipulations and by cheating in the battle against global poverty. We also saw that the SDG wine distracts from the empty stomach and from the structures of the global economy. And finally, we have to admit that actually we should be drinking water, not wine, because the industrialized model and the imperial mode of living need to be abandoned and not diffused. I would like to thank you for the attention.